Hello, my name is Travis Monk. This is one of a series of videos involving chemistry and biochemistry and how they relate to biology. In this video, I will be describing four different types of biomolecules, molecules that are essential for all life on Earth. I will focus on the function of these molecules, the elements they possess, and other important qualities of these molecules. The picture on this slide is of DNA, a type of nucleic acid, which is one of the four different types of biomolecules that will be overviewed here. The first of the four types of biomolecules that we'll be discussing in this video are carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, or sugars, are molecules that are typically used in the body for short-term energy. Due to this fact, some athletes carb load by eating pastas before big games or events. Examples of carbohydrates that you might be familiar with would include starch, glucose, lactose, or sucrose. After listing off some of these carbohydrates you might be familiar with, you may note that most of them end with the suffix ose, O-S-E, which is one way that you can identify a substance as a carbohydrate, just by its name. Carbohydrates are made up of only the elements carbon, or C, hydrogen, H, and oxygen, O. The typical molecular structure of a carbohydrate is provided on the right-hand side of this slide. Carbohydrates typically display a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen, which can also be used to help identify them. Carbohydrates can be classified by their size as monosaccharides, disaccharides, or polysaccharides. The prefix mono means one, di means two, and poly means many. The term saccharide refers to sugars. When you put these together, the classification describes the number of monomers or small subunits that make up the molecule that you're describing. The picture on the bottom shows the relative sizes of mono, di, and polysaccharides. Each red hexagon is a monosaccharide. As you can see, when two join up, they form a disaccharide. If you join two disaccharides, you would end up with the structure on the bottom, a polysaccharide. An example of a monosaccharide would be glucose. It's a major source of energy for humans. Diabetes is a disease characterized by individuals that cannot regulate their blood sugar levels properly. Lactose is an example of a disaccharide. It's made up of two monosaccharides stuck together, specifically glucose and galactose. Lactose is found commonly in milk products, and individuals that lack the ability to break down this sugar, uh, they have a disease called lactose intolerance. Starch is an example of a polysaccharide. It's made up of chains of glucose, hundreds in length, and is used for long-term storage of energy in plants. Many monosaccharides have the same chemical formula. They're made up of six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms. But those atoms are arranged differently. Due to this, these monosaccharides are called isomers. The prefix iso means something's the same. In this case, you have the same atoms that are just arranged differently. You will see the prefix iso many times throughout the year, and such as the terms isotope and isotonic. And you may be familiar with other uses of the term, such as an isosceles triangle, where two sides are the same length. Two monosaccharides that are isomers are shown in the picture to the right. Glucose and galactose both contain the same number of the same elements, but uh, highlighted in red here, the OH and the H have switched orientations. Such a seemingly small change is actually quite significant. The second of the four types of biomolecules that will be discussed are proteins. There are over tens of thousands of proteins that humans can produce. Proteins that carry out a tremendously diverse number of jobs ranging from providing structure to cells to speeding up chemical reactions. Proteins are made up of as few as 20 to up to hundreds or so monomers or building blocks called amino acids, some of which are exhibited in the picture to the right. All proteins are made up of the elements carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, some amino acids contain the element sulfur, and some proteins can be associated with other different elements. Again, proteins are made up of between 20 and 200 or so amino acids. Each amino acid has three distinct functional groups that make it up. First, as exhibited on the left, is an amino group. The amino or amine group is boxed in blue and consists of a nitrogen atom bonded to two hydrogen atoms. Second, boxed in red, is the carboxylic acid group, or the acid group. It contains a carbon atom, two oxygen atoms, and a hydrogen atom, and one of the oxygen atoms is double bonded to the carbon atom. If you stick the names of those two groups together, amino group, acid group, you end up with amino acid, the name of the monomer that makes up proteins. 
There are literally countless amino acids, but 20 or so are commonly found in humans. The way that these amino acids differ from one another is in the green box group, called the variable group. The variable group, designated by an R, is named the way it is because it varies from one amino acid to another. There is no element R. R just denotes that there is something else that's found in this location. The variable group can range from a single hydrogen atom in glycine to a large ring in phenylalanine, two specific amino acids that are pretty common in humans. The process by which amino acids come together in a synthesis reaction to form a protein is rather complex, and it will be discussed later in a video entitled Translation, covered far later in the year. For now, what's important to note is that when amino acids come together to form a protein, they are connected by a specific type of covalent bond called a peptide bond. This is why proteins are sometimes referred to as polypeptides. There are many, or poly, peptide bonds that connect amino acids that are sometimes referred to as peptides. The process, as well as where and how the peptide is formed, is illustrated in the image found to the right. As mentioned earlier, proteins carry out a tremendous number of different functions for the cell. One classification of a protein, called an enzyme, functions to speed up chemical reactions by lowering a chemical reaction's activation energy. Activation energy is the amount of energy needed to jumpstart a chemical reaction. Without enzymes, chemical reactions may occur very, very slowly. The graphics on the bottom of this slide show how a chemical reaction would proceed with and without an enzyme. On the left, in red, a chemical reaction is taking place with no enzyme. The activation energy, or the amount of energy between the two lines that are parallel to the x-axis, is quite large. On the right, in green, the chemical reaction is helped along with an enzyme. Note how much smaller the hump is when compared to that on the left. The humps illustrated in these pictures equate to the activation energy for this chemical reaction. There are thousands of different enzymes present in the human body because they are very specific for different types of chemical reactions. Individuals that are lactose intolerant, for example, have a dysfunctional enzyme called lactase. Instead of breaking down the sugar lactose normally, individuals that are lactose intolerant can't break it down at all or do it very slowly. As a result, individuals that have this disease suffer GI distress when they consume products that are high in lactose. Since enzymes are so specific, if an individual is lactose intolerant, they may not have any other problems breaking down foods. One important thing to note about enzymes is that they are not used up when those chemical reactions occur. They're not spent. They can be used over and over again. The image on the right explains a number of things that we've just been talking about. As you can see, the shape of the substrate, which would have been the sugar lactose from our previous example, fits very specifically with the enzyme, or lactase, that we talked about earlier. Another sugar, such as sucrose, probably wouldn't fit properly into the enzyme lactase. There's a different enzyme that would be responsible for breaking it down. In the three-step process shown in this picture, you can see that the enzyme is not spent in the process. It can be reused to break down more of the substrate. In addition to being specific in terms of what products enzymes break down, they also operate best under very specific conditions. The image to the right just shows two examples of factors that can influence the rate of enzyme activity, temperature and pH. If the temperature or the pH is too high or too low, enzymes don't work very well at all. The reason for this is that the protein can change its shape slightly with environmental changes. When the protein changes its shape, the site of the enzyme that comes in contact with the substrate doesn't fit like a lock and key quite as well as it should. The next type of biomolecule that we will discuss are nucleic acids. There are two types of nucleic acids that we'll be learning about, DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA, or ribonucleic acid. The picture to the right shows the typical structures of single-stranded RNA and double-stranded DNA, as well as some of the different groups that make this molecule up. The primary function of nucleic acids are to store the cell's information from one generation to the next and to produce proteins. Nucleic acids always contain the elements carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. This video will only provide a brief overview of nucleic acids as we will spend almost an entire quarter talking about nucleic acids in a unit on genetics. Nucleic acids can be tremendous in size. They can be made up of hundreds of millions of nucleotides, which are the subunits or monomers of nucleic acids. 
The picture to the right shows the structure of a nucleotide in the bottom left, highlighted in red. Each nucleotide consists of three different components. First, as illustrated by the black spheres and the letter P in this picture, are the phosphate groups. Second, as shown as a blue pentagon with the letter S, is a sugar, which is deoxyribose in DNA, hence the D in the name of this nucleic acid, deoxyribonucleic acid, and ribose in RNA, hence the R in the name of that nucleic acid, ribonucleic acid. Finally, each nucleotide contains a nitrogenous or nitrogen-containing base. There are four different bases in DNA, G, which stands for guanine, A, which stands for adenine, C, which stands for cytosine, and T, which stands for thymine. RNA also has four bases, the same ones that are in DNA, except RNA does not contain T or thymine, instead it contains U or uracil. Modern computers use zeros and ones, they use binary code to code for everything that you can do on a computer. DNA uses these four different bases to code for almost everything that makes you what you are. Lipids are the fourth and last type of biomolecule that we'll be discussing this unit. While all of the other biomolecules possess similar structures and contain the same monomers, lipids are not so straightforward. It's a much more diverse group. All lipids contain the elements carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but some can contain different elements such as phosphorus. We'll just leave it at that because, as the image to the right illustrates, there are lots and lots of different classifications of lipids such as fats, oils, waxes, steroids, glycolipids, and phospholipids. In terms of the structure of lipids, we're just going to be discussing two different parts, glycerol and fatty acid groups. Fatty acids are long hydrocarbon chains. What that means is that there are long lines of carbon that are bonded to carbon that are bonded to carbon that are flanked or surrounded by hydrogens. There are three different fatty acids in the image to the right, and the middle one is surrounded in purple. All three of those fatty acids are anchored or attached to a glycerol that's highlighted in orange. Because of the structure of this lipid, it contains three fatty acids connected to that glycerol anchor. This type of lipid is called a triglyceride. The tri refers to the three fatty acids connected to that glycerol. You may read nutritional information about saturated or unsaturated fats. What this refers to is the fatty acid chains that that lipid contains. If all the bonds between the carbons are single bonds for the entire lipid, it would be referred to as a saturated fat. It is saturated or filled to the brim with single bonds. Unsaturated fats would contain one or more double bonds between the carbon atoms. You can see an example of one of these double bonds in green on the bottom fatty acid chain. Like carbohydrates or sugars, one of the most important functions of many lipids involve energy. While carbs are used for short-term energy in the body, fat is used for long-term energy storage. Fats do a great job of storing a lot of energy, which would be measured in calories, per unit space. In one gram of a typical carbohydrate, there are four calories worth of energy, as illustrated in the picture to the right. In one gram of a typical fat, there are nine calories worth of energy. To store the same amount of energy in reserve, in case you were to say be stranded on a deserted island, you could either carry around 10 pounds of fat or 20 pounds of carbohydrates. This is why meat, such as steak, which is very high in fat, contains so many calories than a lean or low-fat meat such as salmon or chicken. That is the end of this video overviewing the four different types of biomolecules that we'll be discussing in this unit. If you're interested in learning about other chemistry or biochemistry concepts as they relate to biology, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you.